My name is Bill Dynan. I'm a professor at Emory University and a cancer researcher. I'm in the Department of Radiation Oncology and in the Department of Biochemistry. I've been interested in science for as long as I can remember. I, one of my earliest memories uh, was my mother taking me aside and saying that a rocket ship had been sent to the moon that day and that I should always remember this as a, a milestone in, uh, in science, in exploration. Uh, as I went through school, I, I was interested in science and math. Uh, it was fun. I was good at it. I've been interested in <clears throat> agents that, that damage genes, and, and in particular in radiation, since I was in college and started to learn about it. But my opportunity to begin working on this professionally came uh, about 15 years ago when I uh, joined the research program that was uh, run by the Department of Energy uh, called the Low-Dose Radiation Research Program that was aimed at understanding whether there really were harmful effects of very low doses of radiation, such as you might get from medical imaging or from the environment. And this led uh, eventually into a joint project with NASA uh, looking both at low dose radiation such as we might find here on the Earth and at the low and medium doses of radiation to which their astronauts would be exposed during extended journeys through deep space. It's really a fascinating problem. Space radiation is different than what we see on Earth. Uh, and by looking at those differences, we may gain insight you know, both into what NASA is interested in, in, but also insight into how the uh, more common radiation exposures might uh, affect people and their, the things they're made up of. Radiation is a very broad term that can encompass everything from light, warmth, radio waves, x-rays, and the things that we think of as radioactive, right, harmful radiation. The kind of radiation that scientists study and are interested in is this last kind that has the ability because of its energy and because of the way it transfers energy to the human body of breaking chemical bonds. That's the key aspect that makes this radiation different and makes it harmful is it can break the bonds that are in the molecules that make up your body and specifically that make up your genes. So you ask what is high energy radiation and I think the better question is uh, what, what makes radiation dangerous? So it, it can be it's high energy but more importantly it's the way that the radiation transfers energy to the body. Uh, does it transfer energy in a, in a concentrated way, depositing a lot of energy in a very small space at a very high rate? And those kinds of radiation are particularly harmful when we encounter them in the environment and also particularly useful in cancer treatment when they're directed at a tumor. The types of radiation that we're concerned with break chemical bonds and specifically they break chemical bonds that hold your genetic material together. And that damage can lead to death of tissues in the body and can also lead in the long term to cancer. Space, the, the, the entire cosmos is permeated by energetic particles, massive particles. So when we talk about radiation, we talk about x-rays and gamma rays, which are really a form of high energy light. And then we also talk about particles, uh, pieces of atoms that carry a lot of energy and can do a lot of the same kind of damage, but in a more concentrated and more harmful way. It's that kind of radiation that is particularly found in the space environment. Some of it comes from the sun and some of it comes from distant galaxies, but it all has the property of being able to create unique damage in, I say biological systems, but I mean us.
NASA is interested in the risk to their people. Almost everything that we know about radiation risk comes from studies of people that have been exposed to radiation, either accidentally, deliberately, medically, or through atomic bombing. With the type of radiation that NASA is interested in, there really are no people that have been exposed to any significant amount. The astronauts today see fairly small amounts of radiation because they're in orbit close to the Earth. They enjoy some of the protective effects of the Earth's magnetic field. So we really have no data from exposure of people to predict what the risks are. So it falls to scientists to do experiments using isolated cells or using experimental animals to understand what these risks might be and to predict the risks to astronauts. We, we travel to a particle accelerator in Long Island, New York. Uh, this accelerator is a couple of miles around. It accelerates particles to the very high energies, to the very high speeds that would be found in space. And it directs them through a tunnel into our samples. Our work is with human cells grown in the laboratory, but NASA's research program also includes work with rats and mice that are exposed to the radiation so that they can learn about what the effects are on the whole animal. After all, cells don't get cancer, but rats and mice do. Our research is on the effects of radiation on DNA, which is the molecule that makes up your genes. It's found in every cell of the body. We have about six feet of DNA in every cell in the body, and it's a long, thin molecule. Think about it as, uh, well, think about it as this pencil. So radiation passes through, and it breaks the DNA. That's potentially a lethal event, and the cell needs to put this back together, perhaps not perfectly, but in a way that's good enough for the cell to survive. And occasionally something goes wrong. It's stuck together in the wrong way, and that's what gives rise to cancer, or that's one of the things that gives rise to cancer. We have made a discovery in our time at Emory, and that relates to what happens to cells after the DNA is broken and they're unable to repair it. That is, the free DNA ends are just sitting within a living cell, and that cell undergoes a complicated stress response. It tells the cells around it that something's gone very wrong, and we think that that makes it susceptible to further damage. And if so, that's a very important thing to understand, and if we could uh, suppress this phenomenon in some way, suppress this stress response, it might be a way to provide some level of protection to people that are exposed to space radiation. There is another reason for being interested in this kind of radiation, and that has to do with new forms of cancer therapy that are based not on X-rays or gamma rays, as radiation therapy is today, but on heavy particles that will be shot into the tumor and will stop there and will deposit their energy precisely like a magic bullet within the tumor. Emory, Emory Winship Cancer Center is uh, building such a facility in Atlanta that will use particles known as protons, which have the ability to stop and deliver all their energy into a tumor. And there is a, an even more advanced technology that's in development around the world to use heavier atoms that are even more effective in stopping and depositing energy specifically within a tumor and not within the surrounding normal tissue. There is the possibility, there is the hope, that this will allow cure of cancers today that can only be delayed or, or treated but not stopped. Fundamental research into the mechanisms by which energetic particles kill cells, how they affect normal tissue, how they affect tumors, 
will enable us to make the most of this new generation of cancer therapy when it's available, perhaps sometime within the next decade. You asked if I've had undergraduate students work in my laboratory, and the answer is yes. I've, I've actually had several dozen undergraduates come through the laboratory. I also had a high school teacher in the laboratory one summer. My advice to someone who's considering a career is to, is to do what you like, do what you love. Uh, I think there is a feeling among students today that they want to do something that uh, offers economic certainty, a lot of people that are interested in finance or the law, and those are absolutely good things to do if that's what you love. But I will say that we're never going to run out of questions in science. And so if you pick a good problem, pick a good problem at the start of your career, that you will experience uh, personal rewards from this, that it will allow you to do something that you really love and are satisfied with. So you asked me, how does a student find a career in science? Uh, what do they do if they think they're interested in medicine, but they're not sure? So I've seen lots of students uh, who face this problem, and some of them have gone on to careers in medicine and been very satisfied with that. But others find that they're more interested in the science, in the medical science that under, uh, underlies the development of new cures or the understanding of disease. And I would give them two pieces of advice. And one is to really make the most of their college years and their college courses. Because it's a time in life when you can explore different things that you may never have the opportunity to come back to. Learn about different kinds of science and learn about mathematics because math is going to be more and more important in all kinds of scientific research. And the other piece of advice is go and meet some scientists. Talk to your science professors. Uh, take the opportunities that the department where you're majoring uh, affords to you to just meet people, ask what they do, and find an opportunity to do some kind of internship within a laboratory. This will not only help tell you if you're interested in something, it will give you a good start on a, a future career, and it, it may even lead to something that's exciting, productive, the opportunity to publish something, give a presentation, and get a taste of what success is like in science. One thing that I might comment on is I, I do see people nowadays who are discouraged about the future of science, uh, whether there's going to be enough money to do science in the future, whether there'll be jobs for people. And uh, it, it is a difficult time. It, it is a time when some people in science are leaving, they're doing other things. But in the long run, and you really do need to think in the long run when you're considering a career, the opportunities will always be there for people who are good at science to make important contributions to society. I encourage people to, to do what they love and to never be discouraged and never give up.